Welcome to Soil Sessions, a webinar series by the Soil Health Partnership. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Stacy McCracken, the Communications Lead for SHP. At this time, I would like to introduce our host, Anna Teeter, SHP's Minnesota Field Manager, to start this soil session. Thanks, Stacy. As she said, my name is Anna Teeter. Um, and today I will be talking to you about soil health indicators. I wanna give you a little background about myself before we get started. I've been with the Soil Health Partnership since August of 2019, and I'm currently living in Southwest uh, corner of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. I cover the entire state and my sites cover most of the state, as far north as Grand Forks, as far east as the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin, and as far south as the corner of Iowa, Minnesota, and South Dakota. I'm originally from Southeast Wisconsin and got both my bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My master's research focused on nitrogen efficacy from fall applied manure with a nitrification inhibitor and cover crop and its effect on corn. Today, I wanted to talk about soil health indicators because soil health is a very active area of research. And this is also a main area of focus for the Soil Health Partnership. Additionally, soil health indicators can seem mystified because they are not talked about in depth. I will not be covering every single type of soil health indicator that is recommended or being used, but I will touch on the ones that SHP is focusing on both on and off the farm. First, I wanna talk about what soil is not. Soil has been tr traditionally seen as just a medium that can support crops in their roots and hold fertilizer for crop uptake. And as we know, this is not true. Soil is also not a closed system. It is leaky and that can have impacts on your bottom line and the environment. We also know that soil is not uniform, which has a major impact on how it can function and how it reacts to management. Soil is dynamic, meaning it changes over the landscape as well as over time. Additionally, the soil is biologically active and this activity for microbes is what cycles nutrients and helps build soil structure. This also changes geographically and over time. To start critically evaluating soil health, there needs to be a mindset change. And so here I've presented a, de a basic definition of soil health. Healthy soil functions as a living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. The, the difficult part in capturing this as data finding indicators that rec uh, accurately represent these soil functions that also pertain to how our crops do and how it affects animals and humans. So how is this quantified? First, I wanna define what a soil indicator should do. I think something important to discuss here is that the definition for relevant soil health indicators does change depending on the system you're working within. Soil health in a rice paddy is likely very different than soil health in corn soy rotations. Soil health indicators are pieces of information that can describe how your soil is functioning. In an agricultural context where we are talking about cash crops such as corn, soy, and wheat, we want our soil health metrics to be able to measure the changes in soil health over time due to things like management. While some indicators are correlated with yield, not all indicators can be or should be correlated with yield. Soil health indicators can be observational, where you notice improvement without taking measurements or quantifiable, where you typically end up taking samples and performing some sort of analysis. There are different categories of indicators, which reflect the major areas of soil and soil function, physical, chemical, and biological indicators. I will be covering some of these in the next few slides. Physical indicators estimate how soils behave structurally, and physical indicators have been uh, studied for a very long time as the soil science departments were formed from a study called agricultural physics. Currently, we are starting to focus on indicators that help soil function in terms of soil health, such as providing proper environment for healthy crops and microbe growth. This means looking at indicators such as water infiltration, bulk density, aggregate stability, and available water capacity. And there are many more, but these are just a few. Chemical indicators have been also around for a long time and have been critically important to our ability to produce the amount of food, fuel, and fiber that we currently do. 
Chemical soil health indicators fall along the same lines as good nutrient management, making sure we're using nutrients efficiently, avoiding over application of nutrients that can end up in the environment. Macro and micronutrients are important indicators to keep track of and are an important part of nutrient management plans. Additionally, salinity and sodicity, pH and toxins such as heavy metals are important indicators as they affect crop growth and human health. It is also good to note that chemical indicators and biological indicators, which I will be talking about next, can overlap, especially when looking at things like mineralization. Chemical indicators will not be a major focus of today's presentation because there are many great resources out there that are much more specific to your location and are based on university recommendations. Biological indicators are important for recognition of relationship between microbes, the soil, macrofauna like plants and animals, and others. Research looking at these indicators have increased steadily over the last 10 to 20 years as technology has improved, although it was more difficult to correlate these indicators directly with crop performance. Some biological indicators are evaluating microbial genetics to get an uh, understanding of what role they play in the soil. Root health assays are another uh, indicator, soil respiration, organic carbon and nitrogen, and pathogen load. There are many more indicators currently being studied and evaluated that are not listed here. Soil indicators can be observed and measured both in the field and in the lab. Although they do not usually measure the same thing, they can give you the clues about how your soil is functioning on your farm. Soil health indicators on the farm are not measuring one specific characteristic of the soil, but instead are measuring the impact of multiple functions of your soil working together. All of these categories overlap into the other. Soil microbes affect uh, soil aggregation, soil texture affects nutrient load and buffering capacity, soil organic matter in combination with soil microbes greatly affects nutrient mineralization. These categories are created by humans for us to more easily characterize and understand the soil. Although they can all seem separate, they all impact one another. Focusing on making improvements in all three categories will help you see changes in field. Soil health indicators on the farm are just as important as indicators in the lab. Through working with our SHP farmers, as well as others in the soil health community, we've created a list of indicators that you can use to help evaluate soil health. Water infiltration, soil aggregate shape and stability, smell, erodibility, root health, and trafficability. Use your senses to observe soil health. Your eyes and your hands are some of the best tools that you have on your farm. Soil aggregation is a critical and easy to observe indicator. In the bottom right corner, you can see a platy soil structure, which is typically very brittle in nature. This is a symptom of poor soil demand that uses tillage. This type of aggregate also tends to prevent water infiltration as there are less soil pores moving vertically through the soil. In comparison with the other two pictures, you can see that there are granular structures in these soil aggregates which means there are more soil, pro more soil pores. The aggregates within uh, here are more easily uh, spaced and allow room for root growth and water infiltration. Plants and microbes create different substances that help hold aggregates together and form a more stable environment, which is why you can see on the, the picture on the left and the top right, both are found in uh, small grain rotations. Well aggregated soil tends to hold together better than wet, uh, better when it's wet, uh, which helps to keep soil in place. Over time, soils that are platy can start to transform into a more granular structure by reducing tillage and introducing more root matter, which helps build soil aggregation. Improving soil aggregation tends to improve many other issues as well. Water infiltration that occurs slowly after an intense rain can indicate that the soil does not have good structure, as seen in this image here. This can cause soil crusting, erosion, and nutrient losses. Improving soil aggregation by reducing soil disturbance and tillage can help. Additionally, introducing more soil pores with plant roots will move water through the soil profile more easily. 
Poor infiltration can also be a result of low spots close to the water table or very high concentrations of clay, although this should not be a default assumption. Soil erosion is a scene many of us are familiar with. Although it may not look like it affects much, much more than that specific area, soil washes from the entire field uh, into that same gully year after year. Erosion causes nutrient losses and poor aggregation. Reducing disturbance to improve aggregation can help along with protecting the soil surface with plant residue and live cover crops. Additionally, other conservation practices like grass waterways can help reduce the speed at which water moves across the field, helping prevent erosion. The fastest way to degrade your soil is to lose it. In terms of trafficability, when there are improvements to soil structure and the soil surface is protected, many growers have mentioned being able to get into the field earlier, both in the spring and the fall. This means spending less time uh, rescuing stuck equipment and being able to drive over the soil faster, making trips across the field more efficient. These kinds of improvements can happen somewhat quickly depending on the intensity of new management, like no-till and cover crops. And in this image, you can see harvest from this last fall uh, where corn was still standing in the other field. This grower has a strip-till, no-till uh, operation, um, which includes cover crops. And this allows him to move more efficiently uh, across the field, even in wet conditions. Plant roots are another clue to tell you when you have issues such as compaction, anaerobic conditions, or disease pressure. Promoting diversity in your rotation gives your microbes different food sources as well as different root structures, which can provide things like a low C to N biomass or cause large roots which promote pores and allow better aeration in the soil. As you can see in these images, there's quite a variety of things going on. On the left image is uh, demonstrating the diversity in plant roots. You can see uh, an alfalfa plant on the farthest left, corn, soy, rye, and then wheat moving to the right. Plants like corn and have deeper roots that are larger and tend to create larger pores, while things like rye and wheat have fibrous root masses, which tend to help build and protect the soil. In the middle picture, you can see corn that is purpling due to anaerobic conditions where phosphate is no longer available to these plant roots. And in the picture, you can see corn that has had a, uh, a hard time getting out of the uh, seeding trench because of sidewall compaction. Changing management on your farm to include soil health means you must be patient, and these changes can happen very slowly over many years. The soil needs to transform to its new normal before it can perform for you. Make sure to document your journey. Then you can see where you started. You can use this to keep track of what you've tried as well as help others be more successful. I would also talk to someone in your area who has implemented these practices as well, as they are a wealth of knowledge. If you see images like I presented earlier on your farm, ask yourself why those things are happening. Is the water not infiltrating in your soil because you have clay soil, or is it happening because your soil that has been worked and now doesn't have any soil structure or pores and water is surfacing on the top? Keep asking yourself why things are the way they are on your farm. Improving soil health isn't just a one input change. Making a one simple, one simple input change isn't going to get you to the as it's a mental change and where you need to start implementing changes over your entire operation. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't start with something simple like introducing a cover crop before soybeans, but keep them pushing and incorporating new practices onto your fields. This is an image of corn planted into rye in northeastern Wisconsin, and this was the first year that the grower had decided to implement a rye cover corn. As you can see, it's not a perfect stand of corn, but has since learned that uh, applying some nitrogen at planting has helped to mitigate the issue. Action that you can take on your farm. Reduce soil disturbance so that you can build soil structure and provide a better environment for your microbes. Improving aggregation 
uh, stability helps with infiltration, aeration, and prevents soil loss. Adding or, uh, organic matter by reducing tillage and growing more plant biomass while also leaving as much residue from your cash crop on the field as possible will also help. You may have to make adjustments with your planter to help get through the residue from the previous year. Although ideally an active soil community would be able to de decompose some of the residue. Increasing organic matter also increases water holding capacity and nutrient cycling, which helps reduce stress on your crop and can help reduce uh, inputs as well. Keeping soil put is, uh, is very valuable. Pay attention to snow on the side of the road in the winter. When the soil is left bare after tillage, you'll see snurt, which is a great visual example of wind erosion. So don't let your soil just blow or wash away. A fall over winter and cover crop can help you with that. And there are many other things that you could do. The fastest way to degrade your soil is to lose it. So don't give away your best resource. So what indicators is SHP collecting? We are measuring things that must be evaluated with, evaluated with laboratory testing. We evaluate nutrients and make infield observations as well. Um, but we also collect soil health measurements using the Cornell Comprehensive Assessment of Soil Health. This looks at soil texture, available water capacity, soil organic matter, soil protein, soil respiration, active carbon, as well as total carbon, carbon and nitrogen. Although soil texture, soil organic matter, and total carbon and, and nitrogen can be performed at most laboratories, Cornell has utilizes these other special soil health tests. These are measured and analyzed at Cornell Soil Health Lab, and I will be giving a brief description how these measurements are performed, but that is not a replacement for using the actual procedure provided by Cornell. Soil texture is a critical component, I'm sure as you all know, that affects other soil characteristics. It is defined as the mineral portion of soil and comprised of three size fractions, sand, silt, and clay. Soil texture can impact pH, available water capacity, and nutrient avail availability, just to name a few. As you can see in this image, uh, the different combinations of clay, sand, and silt will give you your soil texture, and it is measured by separating out the sand fraction by a sieve, and whatever is left is dispersed with water. The silt fraction settles, and the clay is left uh, suspended in the water. All three are dried and weighed. Using these values, you can then calculate your soil texture. Available water capacity. Um, this is the total amount of water that can be held in the soil that is plant available, or the amount of water between field capacity and permanent wilting point. Although many of us are not thinking about our soil's ability to hold water because the weather we have seen in the last few years has been so wet, there will be some concern at some point in the future when things start to dry up. Even when conditions aren't extreme, it is good to know that there will be consistent water to crops, crops to prevent stress. This is also an important factor in well-drained soils such as sandy soils. A goal of many growers is to improve their soil's ability to hold moisture because soils that have higher availability, uh, high, higher available water capacity have to be irrigated less. Available water capacity is determined by wetting soil samples and putting them under pressure to simulate field capacity and permanent wilting point, and then measuring the difference in weight. If your goal is to improve available water capacity, increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. That could help. Wet aggregate stability measures the soil's aggregate ability to hold together when wet and being impacted by rain. This is important because nutrients and chemicals that can impact the environment can be lost from the field due to erosion, as well as continue to destroy the soil structure. This is tested using a rainfall simulator where soil aggregates are rained on at a rate of 12 millimeters in five minutes, which is approximate to a heavy thunderstorm. Then uh, after that, the stable aggregates are measured. To improve aggregate stability, focus on building microbial activity and plant growth throughout the entire growing season. This promotes biological glues to form as well as build organic matter. I will warn that you can reverse your progress with aggressive tillage.
Soil organic matter consists of the non-mineral portion of the soil, which is made up of, of the living and dead things in the soil, including plants, animals, and microbes. Organic matter has many important roles. It holds water, nutrients, and carbon. It is a major part of nutrient cycling, and it also helps with soil aggregation. Building organic matter happens slowly over time, and it requires a positive influx of carbon into the soil. Soil organic matter is measured using loss on ignition, which takes a soil sample and burns it at 500 degrees Celsius to burn off any carbon in the soil and leave only the mineral or ash component behind. Soil protein helps estimate the amount of organic nitrogen found in the soil and also describes the soil organic matter quality. As soil organic matter is broken down by microbes, it releases nitrogen, some of which is required by the microbes to survive. If there's not enough nitrogen in the processing of soil organic matter, it slows down the process and there is little nitrogen available in excess for plants, which is what we want. Soil protein or autoclave cit citrate extractable protein describes the laboratory test where an assay for protein content measures the concentration of nitrogen. To improve soil protein, lower, lowering the C to N ratio of cash crops or cover crops um, so that there's more nitrogen being incorporated into the soil um, and is left as biomass on the field will help feed your microbes. Active carbon are small molecules of soil organic matter that are easily broken down and consumed by microbes. This can be considered a food source that is available in the soil. This type of carbon can show that there have been changes in management more quickly than others. This is measured by using a special solution to oxidize the soil solution, which then turns it purple. Different concentrations of active carbon turn different colors of purple and that, that color is measured to determine the concentration total. Building soil organic matter over time and encouraging good microbial growth can help increase active carbon. Soil respiration tells you how active the microbes are in the soil as they expend CO2. The same as you and me, when we eat and breathe normally, we expel CO2. And as we become more active and you put more people in a room, the more CO2 they produce. Less activity means less eating or breaking down of soil organic matter and mineralization of nutrients. Soil respiration is measured by drying the soil completely and then re-wetting it and placing it in a jar that can capture CO2 in a trap. And then that is measured. Consider your microbes to be a livestock. They require a balanced ration or a good C to N ratio, or for cattle, that means enough starches and fiber, nutrients and protein. Um, as we feed our cattle, they do their job that they were bred for and either create meat or milk. The same with our microbes, they start to mineralize the soil organic matter and both produce um, both CO2 and excrement for cattle, it's manure, and for microbes, it's nutrients and other exudates. And I want you to ask yourself, are you providing an appropriate ration for your, your microbes or your livestock? Are your livestock having to scavenge for food? Do they have an adequate environment? And is there high prevalence of disease because of unhealthy living conditions? Many results um, can be controlled by the environment, time, management, and rotation. Don't, list, don't let this discourage you as making small improvements over multiple areas will help. What does the indicator tell you about the soil microbe environment? Are there many indicators that seem off or low? Does this happen in every time you, you do this test or does it align with other indicators? Is there just one indicator off but everything else seems to function pretty well? Observe it, but don't worry too much. And remember, progress isn't linear. Improvements happen on trends not every single year. Compare over five or 10 years at least. Keep an eye out for the ration of your microbes. They require a balanced diet and our laboratory results can help tell us what that is. Bacteria are superior scavengers to plants. Don't compete with them. And so you wanna evaluate what is happening in your field over time. Document management changes on your farm. It will help you gain perspective when things become challenging 
or frustrating and don't seem to be working. Make sure to compare soil types when collecting data. Different soil textures behave differently to management cha uh, changes. A sandy soil will not behave the same way as a silt loam or a high clay soil. And so you'll have to adjust your uh, inputs and strategies accordingly. Remember, implementing soil health is not formulaic. In conclusion, soil health indicators fall into three main categories and can be evaluated in the field and in the lab. There's physical, biological, and chemical indicators. There are many soil health indicators. Keep tabs on a range of them on your farm. Make sure you're creating an environment that favors microbes and fungi. And laboratory tests are a great way to measure indicators that you can't use your senses on, but they're harder to access, so continue to use your senses. For more information, visit soilhealthpartnership.org and go to Farmers and Resource Library to read more about the strategies and recommendations that I made for your farm.